Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, Let's turn, turn tragedy, tragedy to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. Hello, everyone. Welcome here to The Thriving Marriage. Um, I've had quite the run around this morning as I was trying to connect to Facebook Live on my Mac, and apparently Facebook has changed a lot of settings, and so my camera and microphone could not connect. <laughs> so I'm here on my phone, and I apologize if the audio quality is not as good as normal. Um, I'm going to have to figure this out. I was like on a YouTube video just a minute ago trying to figure it out, and that didn't work. So I figured, you know, let's just go with it. <laughs> and then I'll figure out the tech side later. So, welcome here to The Thriving Marriage. My name is Heather Choate, and we're going to be going into part two today of how to save your marriage without getting your heart hurt. It's been a couple weeks since we did the podcast, and I hope that you're having a fabulous summer if you're watching live, and if you're watching the replay, I hope that you're doing well no matter what time of year it is. Um, but my family, we just took uh, a family reunion, a little family trip up to the mountains, and did our first camping trip in seven years. And after I had had our first daughter, uh, Morgan, let's see, seven years ago, right? She was a baby. I vowed I would never go camping with a baby again. <laughs> but our family is getting older and I realized that my son is 13. He only has like five more years at home with us. And so if I wait till all of our babies are grown, then he will be an adult and that won't be the life that I wanted to give him, right? So I just decided to kind of suck and go without sleep so that I could give our children some awesome memories. And ironically, it was the baby that did like the best out of everyone. And it was our two-year-old that did the worst. <laughs> so now that we're recovered from a little bit of sleep deprivation there, um, but really refreshed from being up in the mountains and having no signal whatsoever, it was kind of nice to disconnect, right? I'm happy and grateful to be back here with you all. So before I go into how to save your marriage without getting your heart hurt, remember this is the second part. So if you haven't yet heard the first part, I encourage you to go and listen to that um, here on the podcast. You can check it out on iTunes or Spotify or our thrivingmarriagepodcast.com website. And that will give you some context because we're going to go a little bit deeper into the second part of that process today. But before I get into any of that, we're going to do our client win of the week. And this client has asked to remain anonymous, so we're not going to share her name. And we're just going to call her H. <laughs> uh, and H shares some wins. She says, my husband has actually said that he has enjoyed spending time together and that he has gone out of his way to spend more time. This is the first positive thing he has said about us in four months since he left. And in the path process that she is going through, we know that this is part of what we're going to talk about today, um, part of the ceasefire stage. So she's been able to open up communication with her husband. Like she said here, he left four months ago. And so they're able to open up communication, increase that understanding, right? And then we talk about doing that root assessment to uncover all the reasons why they're wanting out. If you guys remember in the last podcast, in part one of this two-part series, we had talked about doing that root assessment and how crucial it is that we uncover the, our spouse's reasons for leaving. We've determined that working on yourself is not enough on its own, right? You can make all the positive changes in the world. We often ask our clients, you know, before we'd say, you know, how are you doing, quote unquote, working on yourself, right? How many of us have heard that we need to work on ourselves? to save our marriage, to get our spouse back. And I get where that's coming from because we need to focus on what we can control. However, what would happen is we would ask our clients, how are you doing working on yourself? And they would be like, I'm doing great. I'm working out. I'm losing weight. I am more patient at home. I'm more present with the kids. I help with the laundry, right? I'm more understanding. I stopped drinking or I stopped the affair or I stopped the nagging and the complaining or the stonewalling or, you know, the not meeting their needs. Right. And then we would ask them, okay, we'd be like, great. That's 
doing a really good job working on yourself. And sometimes like they say like, yeah, like I meditate now every day. And that's awesome. So you're really working on yourself. You're really improving yourself and you're seeing a lot of progress there. That's awesome. Then we'd ask them, well, how is your marriage? And they would say, oh, we're still getting divorced. And right there, we realized that there was still something missing. We were helping them to open up communication and make things feel safe and comfortable again, but their spouse still wanted out. And what we've discovered is that most of us, we have a pretty good idea of one or two of the reasons why they're leaving, right? They'll say things like, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. I'm in love with someone else. I just can't be happy here. You don't meet my needs, right? You know, you don't change. Or I notice the changes that you're making, but they're not going to last. You're just doing them to try to get me back, right? It's just, if I come back to you, then it's just going to go back to the way that it was. I don't want to get hurt again. Or you broke my trust and I can never have that trust restored, right? So we hear all these different stories and all these different reasons that are justifying why they want to leave. And here's the kicker, okay? We can guess and probably have a really good idea. In fact, this may feel like complete truth to you. You're like, I know exactly why they're leaving. You know, they're leaving because they say, I can't trust you because two years ago I did have an affair and we've been trying to work on things ever since then. I did stop the affair, but they say that they can never trust me again. So that's a pretty easy reason to guess why they would say, I, I don't trust you. But here's the thing that we've discovered after working with, you know, thousands of you guys, uh, thousands of students now around the world, is that while we can know and guess at one or two of the reasons why they have that story and that belief about us that's justifying their reasons and leaving, there are always one to two more that we have no idea about. We're completely clueless of. And these are things that have usually been going on for weeks, months, and sometimes even years. And unless we uncover all of their reasons for leaving, then we aren't going to get them back. It's like we have to cut off the legs of that entire table, right? And so that it won't stand. And if you cut off, you know, two or three, it's going to be really wobbly and you know, you've made some great progress. But unless we completely remove all of those root issues, then we're not going to get them back because they're going to hold on to that, right? It's their defense mechanism. If you guys remember, those of us who've been listening for a while, and here we are like into the 50s, right? The 53, 54 podcast, whatever this one is, right? Um, if you guys remember, those reasons, those stories that they have are their defense mechanism. They don't want to get hurt again. And so when we can understand where that's coming from, then we can have a bit of compassion and we realize, you know, this isn't really about me. It's more about what they're going through and that they are afraid of getting hurt again. They're afraid of being vulnerable again. And so that's where this is coming from. And we're going to continue to run up against their story again and again and again, no matter what kind of changes we make, unless we help them to change their story. It's not about working on yourself. That is not the solution to saving marriage. That's a solution to great personal growth and development, and I'm all about that. And we definitely uh, encourage you to have a thriving life no matter what. Um, and that is part of it, but it's not just saying that you've changed. It's actually showing your spouse that you've changed. And as you show them that you've changed, guess what? You've actually worked on yourself and you're saving your marriage. So which one do you want? more, right? <laughs> you guys are here because you want to have a happy, healthy, and thriving marriage. So that's why it's crucial that we understand working on ourselves is not the solution by itself, that we have to change their story and their justifications about us. So just a quick recap, what we talked about last time is that root assessment. And that's where we go in deep with you and help to uncover all of the reasons why they're leaving. Not just the one or two that you have guessed, but the two or three that you are completely unaware of. So that then we can really uh, make progress there and helping them to let that story go to be able to feel safe enough to put that defense mechanism to rest for good and that they can know that they could be happy with you again. And then the next step there after the root assessment is that we open up communication. 
because if we aren't communicating, we cannot change their story, right? And so we talked about how to do that and how it's kind of the ugly communication at first, especially, you know, we, we have clients all along the spectrum here. If you're completely stonewalled and shut off and there's no communication, right? Like every time you talk about the relationship, you just meet a brick wall, right? Or you get total resistance or there's a lot of, um, you know, along the spectrum here of volatility and it just always turns into an argument. It always backfires, right? Um, all the way to, you know, maybe you've even made the progress where you're friendly and you can even get along, but you still aren't resolving those root issues, right? So wherever you are in that spectrum, it's really crucial that we get open communication so that we can resolve those root issues and successfully save our marriage. So that's what we do with our push versus pull step there as part of this method is we show you how to stop unintentionally pushing them away from you, right? We talked about stop demanding that they work on the marriage, you know, the manipulation, the pleading, the desperation, um, the freezing out of fear, but those are all just fear responses. And so what we need to learn to do ourselves is how to emotionally process through those, those challenging emotions and those challenging situations so that then we stop pushing them further away. Whenever we demand that they work on the marriage with us, we push them further away. And whenever we come at them with manipulating, with pleading, with desperation, or we just don't say anything because we don't know what to say, it's only going to push them further away. And so we want to pull them towards us instead by getting to that place where we feel calm and centered and that we increase our understanding towards our spouse and they will feel that shift within us. And we will go from being an unsafe place to open up and communicate things to a safe place to open up and communicate about things. And that safe place at first is going to be the ugly kind of communication, especially if these issues have been going on for a long time, which is really normal. That's where most of us are when our marriage is struggling, right? And so it's kind of like they're going to emotionally vomit all over us. And their story that they've had justifying their reasons leaving kind of comes full force at us, right? And we have to go through that. And it's not fun and it's not pretty. And I'm not here to give any kind of false hope or false expectations. Um, I know there's some other kind of people out there that are giving it like a really pretty picture and it's just not. And so I want to be really honest with you guys always about the process. But when we have that perspective that this is part of the journey, then that gives us just that perspective, right? That this is just a step. In fact, I can celebrate it because it's better to have this kind of communication than no communication at all. So that's where we left it off last time was like, here you go. You've opened up communication. It's really ugly and it's not pretty and it's not fun to go through. There you go. And we kind of left it at that, which was, which was funny to me because that's not the entirety of the journey, but I wanted to go deep into each step and give it its own time to really, um, have an impact. So that brings us now today to the third step of this path method. So now that we've opened up communication, now we go into what we call the ceasefire stage. And so here, oh, I'm looking at the wrong place. See, I'm on my phone, not my, not my laptop. So for those watching, you might see my eyeballs going a little bit crazy here. <laughs> All right, so the ceasefire stage. Um, I love this phase and most of our clients really love this phase too. This is when you kind of feel like, wow, we're making so much progress because what we do is we shift that negative communication to neutral communication, which sounds a lot better, right? Instead of the really ugly, nasty kind, we have neutral communication. And what we see happen in this stage is that our spouse is actually going to give us the time of day. We're going to you know, shift from arguments, from stonewalling, from being really angry or really bitter or really cold into being comfortable with each other. And here we often see that spouses, they can talk about anything. So remember our client win, right? Our, our client um, named H for today <laughs> um, said that he's gone out of his way to spend more time with me, right? This is the first positive thing he said about us in four months since he left. So our client here has reached this ceasefire stage, which is our third 
phase of the path method, right? And so here, it feels really good because you start to become more like friends. You start to be able to talk about anything. You both feel safe to, to share because you've increased understanding and empathy and you've given that to them. And so now they feel like they're able to talk about things again. And so you're able to have even really hard conversations in a kind and respectful manner, right? Which for most of us, that would be a huge progress. Would you agree? Is that something that you would like to see in your marriage? I know for me, it changed everything to be able to talk about those deeper root issues that were going on that were causing these painful, painful symptoms for us showing up again and again and again to then be able to talk about them in a respectful manner and be able to even work together as a team on them. All right. So here at this stage, we often hear like, wow, I feel like we're friends again. And I feel like we, you know, maybe at this stage, a lot of times we'll see um, that rings are put back on fingers and spouses will even come home if they've been separated or they'll come back to the bedroom if they've been sleeping on the couch or in another place, right? And we see that like maybe now we're going on dates again. And so this stage feels awesome. And it's a huge, huge win. And you feel like, wow, I'm really getting to know them. I understand them. Now, when she says, I need to quote unquote, find myself, I actually know what that means. It's not just this weird nebulous, like dismissive reason that she's wanting out. Now I actually understand that she's feeling really lost. She gave herself to her, to our children so much all these years that she doesn't even really know who she is. She isn't prioritizing herself. This is what it looks like now for her. Okay. And it's going to be different for everyone because we're all different. Right. And so here it's like, wow, I'm really getting to know my spouse better than I have in a long, long time. And I love this question that Dominique just shared here as I'm doing this live in the thriving marriage Facebook group. He said, how do you stop being friend zone at this point? And I love this because if you guys remember at the beginning, um, this is what we would often hear. Like, I'm working on myself. We're getting along better than ever before. The arguments have stopped. You know, um, we are hanging out and we're talking about anything. We're talking about like our kids and our goals and our plans. And I'm really getting to know this person. But when I ask them, like, you know, can we renew our vows or, you know, like you want to push it to that next level, you'll hear things like this at this point. Well, I really care for you. And I think we'd be better as friends, right? I really care for you. Um, I really like the way that we're talking now. I think this is going to be great because we can really co-parent after the divorce, right? And it's so frustrating. Uh Oh, I don't know if my video stopped. I hope not. <laughs> to me, it looks like it's still going. I just got to notice that the video might have stopped. So hopefully not. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, this is definitely getting into the friend zone. And this is where most people miss the mark completely. And where honestly, we did until we had that big discovery. And no one else is really talking about this idea that we must change their underlying story, those underlying beliefs, because we can get to this level that feels really, really good. However, if we haven't fully addressed all of those root issues causing their story to show up, we're not going to get them back. Their defense mechanism is going to win the day. And that to me is so tragic because it feels really awful when you've made so much progress and you're like, we're connecting and we're communicating and you know, all of those really negative patterns we were in has stopped and we've made so much progress you know, like they came back home, we're going on dates again, we're talking about things we haven't talked about in years, or maybe we never talked about them. And so here is where it gets hard, right? Because then we're like, well, then they're still leaving, they still want a divorce. So that's what brings us here to the fourth step. We have to get to this kind of friendship, open communication, really neutral communication, um, increasing connection type state first right? And then when you're there, now we have to go into the final step of the path method. And this is where it really brings it all home and kind of seals the deal. <laughs> In fact, we're calling it, we, we call it identity shift. And it's kind of like closing a deal, right? If you're in negotiations or anything, it's like you seal the deal. But how do we do that here? 
what we need to do at this stage where we shift their identity, we shift the story and we fully remove the story is that we help you systematically remove all of their old beliefs about you, right? The ones that you know about and the ones that you may not be aware of whatsoever. And we replace them so that they see themselves happy with us again, right? They really truly see the possibility of being happy with us again. Now here's what it's not, because I really wanna make this clear and really listen to your own intuition and what it's gonna tell you about this so that you can understand what you need to do from here, okay? It's not working on ourselves, again, to achieve this, right? It's not about working on ourselves. it's about working on how our spouse views us, about changing their beliefs and about working on those root issues. For example, if the reason is, I just can't trust you. Once trust is broken, I just don't feel like I can ever open my heart again fully to you again. Or if they're saying like, I love you and I care about you, but there's just no romance anymore. I just, I don't feel that passion. I don't feel that connection with you. I don't feel like I can have those feelings again for you, right? You can't just say, well, yes, you can. Yes, you can like open your heart to me. Yes, you can just trust me, right? Yes, you can just have romantic feelings for me, right? We have to show them that we are those things for them, that we are trustworthy. So saying and being are two different things. Do you agree? Saying and being are two very, very different things. And so without even noticing, you've become a better version of yourself as you become the changes that you wanted to, to make. And they will start to see the evidence of that. And then that's gonna bring us here, if my computer over here will work. Good grief. Okay. All right. Yep, here we go. All right, and so how do we do that? Well, first of all, we give you, like it's a basically a five-step loop that repeats over and over and over again. And so we need to know first, what to do, right? What do we do? How do we systematically remove their beliefs, right? How do we uncover what they are? How do we open up communication? How do we make that communication neutral communication? And how do we finally help them let their story go? First, we needed to know what to do, right? Second, we need to know when to do it because it's crucial that we solve problems in the right order. And that's why it's challenging for us to do a podcast and to, to share messages and to share advice. And there's a lot of other advice out there, right? We have like information overload in this day and age, right? Because the same thing that might apply to someone in their situation might be the exact wrong thing for you to do in your situation. So I'll just give an example from like my marriage. My husband comes home and we just smother each other in kisses and hugs and sometimes he brings me flowers and we're just really like sickly in love <laughs> and it grosses out our kids every time and <laughs> I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> but if you were to come home to your spouse and smother them in hugs and kisses and bring her flowers or something, it might totally backfire if you're not in the right state to do that. And so that's why it's crucial that we know not only what to do, but when to do it. When do I apply this, right? Third, if you did it right, right? Getting that feedback. I am a huge like self-help, I guess, like self-improvement, self-progress or whatever, um, junkie, I guess. And I love, you know, the listening to audiobooks and um, podcasts and, and watching inspiring videos and things like that. And oftentimes, you know, I'll, I'll shake my head and I'll say, yeah, this is great. And I'll go and I'll try to do it. However, I have no idea if I did it correctly. And so it's important that we get that feedback. Back in high school, I was in basketball. And so, you know, I knew the importance of shooting a free throw shot correctly. But if I didn't have a coach there tweaking my form, you know, letting me know, Heather, you, you twisted your hips again instead of squaring up your hips to the board, you know, I would have no idea if I did it right. And so I might work myself into the ground trying to achieve a result, but unless I'm getting some feedback, if I'm actually doing it correctly, then I'm going to exhaust myself and it's going to be ineffective. Would you guys agree? How often have we done that in our lives, right? We try to do it ourselves, DIY it, right? And we have no idea if we're even doing it correctly. That's why it's so crucial to get that feedback. 
So that's the third step. That brings us to the fourth step. If we actually did it at all, did we even do the thing that we were supposed to do, right? And having that accountability. And I laugh about this one because it's so true of me and of human nature, right? We will listen to maybe even something like this and we'll like nod our heads and we'll say, yeah, this is so great. I totally agree with this. And then what do we do the next morning? We get up and we do the same thing we always did because those patterns are so challenging and hard to, to interrupt. And sometimes we just forget, we get kind of lazy sometimes, right? Or, you know, life just happens and we just go back to the way it always was. So that's why it's so crucial to know if we even did it and having that accountability to make sure that we're doing it and we're doing it correctly, right? And then now that we've known what to do, when to do it, if we did it right, if we even did it, and we kind of get to that level where we're like, I've got this, I, I mastered this step. Then the fifth part is what to do next, right? So we have this constant loop of what to do, when to do it, if we did it right, if we even did it, and what the next steps are. So that we know, okay, I've reached this level, now what do I do? How do I break out of the friendship mode? How do I encourage her to have romantic feelings for me again? How do I encourage him to trust me again fully, right? And so we repeat that loop over and over again, and we have success, right? So here's also what not to do. We've talked about a couple things here, what not to do, right? <laughs> we don't want to give up when it gets hard. Okay, because I'm on a level with you guys. At this stage, like up until now, like the ceasefire stage, you've, we've reached kind of this, this awesome momentum, right? And you've reached this level that you probably are ecstatic about because your spouse maybe has come home. Um, maybe you have greater conversations than ever before. You're having, you know, this feeling like we're really friends and we can talk about anything. Maybe they put their wedding ring back on and you have a lot of hope here. Like, yeah, this is working. And then you get to stage four and this is when it's going to get hard. And I'm going to be really honest with you. It's going to get really bad. And you can hear it from our clients. You can see some of their, their journey and the, the journey, while it's different for most people, it, there is an overarching theme to almost every marriage restoration. Okay. And so here at this point, most of our clients want to give up. They think it's not working. They think, you know, I backslid. Um, all the progress we've made is lost. And at this point, what happens is that your spouse is going to give you a test. Okay, you've made this certain level of progress. You've connected as friends, right? And, and maybe they've even gone on some dates with you and they're starting to show signs of opening up their heart. And then wham, they're going to give you this test. It's not consciously, like they're not consciously saying, I'm going to test you today, right? <laughs> but what they're unconsciously doing is they're feeling some fear about letting the story go. And so they're going to test the waters here and they're going to see if you're for real and, you know, if they can fully give you their heart again. So we've identified that there's about 12 tests that most spouses put you through before they finally change about you. About 12 tests, tests that they put you through before they finally change their belief about you. And we can show you how to pass all of them. In fact, after working with our clients at this stage, we know what the root issues are and we can kind of preemptively know which ones they're going to test you with <laughs> and help you be prepared for that. And so here, they're trying to see, you know, can I trust you with my heart again? And they're going to see, are you going to go back to begging? Are you going to go back to pleading again? Are you going to go back to stonewalling again? Are you going to go back to manipulating again? Are you going to go back to ignoring my needs again, right? And so we're going to show you how to pass each and every single one of these tests so that your partner knows you are for real and that they can finally let their story about you go. I think of this phase here this final phase is like the last battle of their defense mechanism, right? It's like, I, you know, I've talked about Lord of the Rings way too much on the podcast lately, <laughs> but um, it's like the Mount Doom, right? They're going to give you this final battle before they can let their story be laid to rest. And they, part of them wants so badly. In fact, I would say the majority of them, like of the way they're feeling and everything, they want to let their story go. They want to trust you. They want to give you their heart 
at this stage, but they're still holding on to that last bit of fear, that last bit of resistance. Like I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt again. And so they're going to test us and our spouses know how to test us, right? They know how to push every button that would normally trigger us and send us back into the behavior and back into the cycles and the negative, you know, patterns or habits that we were in. And so that's why it's crucial that we understand that this is not the end. It is a test. And just like any test, they're just wanting to know, you know, is this for real? And any test can be passed. And so we will teach you and be with you and help you to pass this final battle and how to do it successfully so that they can fully say, oh, okay, he's for real. He's really going to be there for me now emotionally. He's really going to connect with me or she's for real. Like sh I can trust her completely, right? I can let this go now. And once that final defense mechanism has been let go, right? Through this like last bit of resistance, this last test that they're going to put us through, then that's when you have the huge breakthrough. And that's when they say, okay, I'm ready to work on this with you. Um, I'm ready to renew our vows, right? And that's when we achieve the full reconciliation. There's a question here by Haley. How long does this last phase last? Usually not long. It's usually usually not too long. Um, and some people could get stuck in this phase and that's when things tend to backslide completely and all momentum is lost, right? And sometimes it can happen really quickly, but that's why it's so crucial that we're prepared in advance, right? <laughs> like prepared for the battle. <laughs> There's that Trojan saying, like he who sweats more in practice and training bleeds less in war. Um, and so that's what it is. It's preparing for these things, knowing that they're going to come and not getting completely discouraged, not giving up when it gets hard here at this stage. Um, and so having that perspective, knowing that your spouse is going to give you the, these final 12 tests to put you through, that they're going to use all of the, the triggers that they know are going to get you, that you're, they're going to try to push all those old buttons, you'll be prepared to do it. And you don't even have to do it perfectly either. We have a lot of clients that still say, you know what? Ah, I gave in. I got super frustrated. I started yelling. Um, I brought up this past thing. I went back to my old behavior this, you know, in this time. Now, what do I do? And that's why it's so important, again, to have that, that feedback loop because it's not about being perfect, but it is about making progress. And so the more times that we can successfully move forward, that's enough. And it's okay if it's a little bit like one step forward, two steps back, because you're still going to make that progress. So I don't want you to feel like you have to pass the test in one final like swoop. And if you don't pass the one test, then it's doomed for you. No, you've made a lot of progress at this point enough. So that there's, there's some, you know, opportunity there, even if you don't do it perfectly, because none of us will, it's not perfect ever. Um, you will, you will be able to fully help them to let their story go. So that is how the entire process works. We identify what those root issues are. We open up that communication. We get them to feel safe with us again. Remember, it's the ugly communication at first. Then we shift that communication to the more neutral, positive communication where you start to feel like friends. And then we'd be really careful not to plateau and stop there because there's still part of their story that they're holding on to. And so as they bring that story to us in full force, we're ready to show them that the changes that we've made are real, that they can be safe with us again. We will work together on this, that we will meet their needs. And as you do that, then they're able to let that story go. And that is when we're able to fully restore the marriage. So if you're missing any one of those pieces, then it's going to not work well. And so that's why we have to have the entire process and we have to do it in order. And Mary says that's exactly where we are right now, which is awesome. So I just want to ask you here as we're wrapping up the podcast today, how good would it feel? Because this is an exercise that we do and it's really crucial that you know where you want to go and the kind of marriage and life and family that you want to have. And at the end of the day, who do I want to be? What is the best version of myself? And how can I become that person a little bit more each day, right? So how good would it feel to replace the overwhelm? Because I know for me, 
it was very overwhelming, right? It was very painful. It was very confusing. And there was just so much fear. But to replace that overwhelm, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this, right? With direction, knowing what to do, when to do it, how to do it, if you did it right, if you even do it right, and then what the next steps are to having that kind of direction to replace any kind of confusion in your mind with absolute clarity that this is what I need to do. And I'm not alone and I don't have to do it on my own. And I have the support and I have the guidance to help me along the way, right? And to replace that fear and that pain with hope and with peace and making that internal shift so that no matter what happens in things that we cannot control at this time in our world history, there's so many things we cannot control, but knowing that I focus on what I can control and I have peace in that. I have hope in that. So that no matter what happens, I am strong, I am centered, I am who I'm meant to be, and that's enough. And living your life from that kind of a state is my greatest hope and prayer for you guys. So um, that is what having a coach on your side with this right method gives you. And so if you guys are wanting to know more about that, I would encourage you to book a call with us. We offer completely free consultations to everyone, our gift to you. Um, and you can book that over at highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. I like to plug that in every podcast because not everyone's going to take action. That's your choice. You can take this and you can do nothing. Um, and I honor you for that because maybe that's the journey that you need to go on. And there will be others that say, I want to take action on this and I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity because it resonates with me and it feels like it's going to help me get where I want to be. I'm tired of the confusion. I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of the fear. I'm ready to move out of that and to become a better version of myself. So if that resonates with you, then I invite you to do that. And I honor everyone who has. And so many of you here in the group um, have taken action and that is beautiful. <laughs> so awesome. All right, now I'm going to go over to our marriage myth buster. I had to write it down old school on a piece of paper because <laughs> I was rushing and I couldn't figure out all this tech stuff. All right, so this one came from our thriving. Ooh, almost dropped my phone. Maybe I should put it down. Okay. All right, so this one comes from you guys over in the, the thriving marriage Facebook group. And I got a lot of really awesome awesome. Oh my goodness. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Marriage myth busters. And so this one today is, is taking a cheater back after more than one occasion. Okay. Let me try again. Taking a cheater back after more than one occasion makes the person desperate. Is that myth or is that truth? So taking a cheater back after more than one occasion makes the forgiving spouse desperate myth or truth. All right. So here is, is, is what I've known after working with thousands of clients and Mark would, I'm sure agree with this. So maybe there is some truth if you take them back again and again, if they've had multiple affairs, multiple breaches and trust, if, if there is no healthy boundaries put in place and you know, if the root issues remain unresolved. So that would definitely indicate maybe more of that desperation, right? So if you're taking them back and you're not putting it in healthy boundaries, you're just taking them back because you want to feel whatever, right? I want to feel safe. I want to feel good enough. I want to feel secure. Um, I want to feel pretty. I want to feel handsome. I want to feel attractive. I want to feel like I'm doing what I should for my kids, right? And you're not putting in healthy boundaries and you're not resolving the root issues so that they're just gonna keep coming back time and time again, then yes, I can understand where that would be, you know, going over into the line of desperation because you're not honoring yourself and you're not resolving the issues. You're just kind of temporarily trying to put a bandaid on things. You're temporarily trying to soothe yourself or, or address an issue at a surface level and you're not making the deeper type change that you need. That would be, in my mind, the definition of someone that's desperate, someone that's not honoring themselves, that's just kind of floundering around and, and not resolving those deeper issues and not protecting themselves from future pain. Now, I can see where this is coming from, this judgment from other people that you're just desperate. You keep taking him or her back and they keep doing this, 
you know, what is up with you, right? Can't you just honor yourself, right? But if you are continually putting in healthy boundaries, respecting yourself, and doing those things that are absolutely crucial to do in the instance of an affair or a major breach of trust, and if you are diligently working to resolve the root issues because something deep in your heart says, I love this person, I want my family to remain intact, and this is the result that I want, I do not find that a desperate person. I find that someone that is strong and willing to tune into their heart and to what they really desire at the end of the day, at the end of their life, right? And that they hold fast to that that vision and striving for that reality in face of tremendous challenges, tremendous challenges and pressure from all sides for it not to work. And I can relate a little bit to this idea of it could seem foolish to people on the outside. They might not get where you're coming from. They don't understand what's in your heart. When I chose to keep my baby when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was laughed at, I was ridiculed, I was judged. I had doctors telling me that I was risking my life and that it wasn't going to end well, multiple doctors. I had people in my immediate family disagree with me and tell me that um, I needed to think about myself and my five children and I needed to be around for them and that that it was it was better to abort this baby to save my own life. And so I understand where that comes from, that you're desperate or you're foolish or what are you thinking? And people don't understand. But at the end of the day, I had to listen to my gut. Um, I don't really know if it's gut, but that inner core part of ourselves that just knows truth and knows what's the right step for us to take. I'm not saying it's right for everyone because I honor everyone's journey and that we each receive that for ourselves, right? We each have that inner guidance. But for me, that was truth. And I knew that I could not live if I chose to abort my baby to save my life. That was something I could not live with. And so I had to hold fast to that vision and to that result that I wanted, even in the midst of all of that pressure to tell me otherwise. (laughs) If you are in that state where you have a spouse that is repeatedly um, broken trust, is repeatedly cheating, is repeatedly having affairs, then, and you know that this is someone that you want to be with and you want to heal this and you want it to be right, then that is not desperate. But what needs to happen in addition to that desire is putting forth the right boundaries, the healthy boundaries that we talk about. And I really encourage you, if you're in this situation, to study what Mark and I teach here about healthy boundaries, how to restore trust, what a healthy boundary is, right? And all these things and and get some help for that situation because it's really challenging to navigate. It's hard to know, do I check their phone? You know, do I check up on them in in this instance? And, And how long do I do that? And what if they resist it? And all these things, right? But there has to be some healthy boundaries put in place to protect yourself and to allow that trust to be restored In addition, you must resolve the root issues that are leading to that behavior. Otherwise, it will repeat itself. And that would not be respectful to yourself to put yourself continually in harm's way. That is never what we advocate for. We do advocate for listening to your heart and putting in the right steps so that you can have the result that you want. And and I believe that that is something that should be honored. So with that being said, thank you so much for joining me today. I have really loved sharing these principles with you guys. I really hope that you're able to listen to your intuition, listen to those aha moments, those things that stand out most to you and that are calling you, come this way, come this way, come this way. Let's let go of some of the pain. Let's let go of the fear and let's choose to become the better versions of ourselves a little bit more each and every day. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.